Hello and welcome to the Ministry of Bridges channel. As you know, this channel is about bridges, my bridges and your bridges. And today it's going to be all about a magnificent bridge here in Scotland, the fourth bridge, the Steel Lady. And there are many, many interesting facts that you want to know about it. Stay tuned. Today's episode is all about the Fort Bridge. My name is Gabriel Neves and this is the Ministry of Bridges. And without delays, here, the Fort Bridge. I hope you enjoy. During the construction of the Fort Bridge, until its opening, what was happening in the world? Queen Victoria was a British monarch. Charles Darwin and Karl Marx passed away. Many newborns were welcomed to the world. Virginia Woolf, Charlie Chaplin, Agatha Christie and Stan Laurel. Just a small note, by then Winston Churchill was a wee toddler. The first electric railway opens the Volks Railway in Brighton, England. Plenty of internal unrest, many mining accidents and serial killers too in London. At last but not least, Glenfiddich single malt scotch whisky was first distilled in Scotland. Last week I told you that the bridge would resemble the Nessie. I hope you agree. And now, the fourth bridge. From the 12th century until 1890, the only way to cross the fourth estuary was by ferry. This ferry connected North and South Queen's Ferry. With no other alternatives, it is no surprise that within dozens of ferry routes, this one was the busiest ferry in Scotland. A bridge was needed to connect the broken railway route from London to Aberdeen. In 1890, the fourth bridge made a connection between the train stations North Queen's Ferry and how many possible. Open in March 1890, it is one of the most recognizable bridges in the world today. The fourth bridge, a marvel of Victorian engineering, was inscribed as a World Heritage Site by UNESCO in July 2015. This steel cantilever bridge is 2.5 kilometers long, carrying a double railway track, 46 meters above the River Forth at a high tide. The fourth bridge remains a symbol of Britain's industrial, engineering and architectural special achievements. In that time, railways dominated the long-distance travel and it is not a surprise the greatest engineering minds were used to create innovative concepts like this bridge. With an impressive industrial aesthetic, the Fort Bridge was the world's first major steel structure. The innovation was the use of mild steel. The recent advancements in steel manufacturing technology made the choice of material easier at the expense of iron. Produced in Scotland and Wales took advantage of the Siemens-Martin process that resulted in steel of consistent quality. This process was invented in 1875, just seven years before the bridge design was submitted for approval. Even today, we have people that fear changes and implementation of new technologies. So, well done, guys. If the material was a premier, just to make things clear, the cantilever design wasn't. This method had been in use for centuries. The major difference was the technical challenge the Fort Bridge presented to its designers. Smart people. I hope it is not controversial to say that wind pressures and the effects of temperature changes were firstly used during the design of this bridge. After all, this was the longest cantilever bridge in the world at that time. Painted the fourth bridge red, a task famously set into folklore is endless. This icon of Scotland perfectly encapsulates the 19th century belief in mankind's ultimate ability to overcome any obstacle. The impossible could indeed be made possible. When opened in 1890, it had the longest bridge spans in the world, nothing less than 541 meters. 
a record held for 27 years. No bad for a time of such incredible scientific and engineering developments. It's hard today to imagine a world record in engineering to be kept for more than a decade. I have no doubts this bridge is still one of the great cantilever trusses bridges in the world. I need to make a pause regarding the fourth bridge and at the same time pay a short homage to the three men who were responsible for this creation. So, who were these men? Designer Sir Benjamin Baker, consultant engineer Sir John Fowler, building contractor Sir William Harrow. Well, by the time they were not yet sirs, you can guess why they have become sirs. Can you imagine having any of this working alongside you today? Wild dreams. These three men and the other over 4,000 that were involved in designing and building the fourth bridge, a great special thank you. Now that the team has been introduced, it is time to look at the construction. For the design type, the cantilever principle was the choice. Here, three workers in 1887 demonstrating the principle. I guessed they could have placed one heavier guy in the middle and it would have worked. And you clearly see the weights on the left and the right hand side. In 1882, the construction began with the steel fabrication workshops on the south side of the river. One year later, work on the foundation started. Later that year, the cantilever structure began. They have worked for two years and in 1885, the last caisson was launched and in the next year, the pier foundations were completed. Well, the three towers need to wait five years since the start of the works to be completed. That was in 1887, and to complete the cantilevers, two more years were needed. Seven years were needed to build the fourth bridge. The granite piers took three years to complete. Sinking caissons. In other words, the watertight casing that reached the seabed needed to have the water pumped out. In two foundations, these chambers were filled with compressed air due to the depth of the river at those locations. Hard workers and brave people indeed. At last, in 1886, the superstructure work commenced. It started from the piers and then to the sides to build a suspended span where the cantilevers met. Works were concluded in 1889 and proper load tests were performed. Two heavy trains, just short of 19,000 tons combined, crossed the bridge slowly, stopping and going to allow the engineers to take measurements. No computers in that time, folks. One short reference to the Tay Bridge disaster in 1879, just a couple of years before in Dundee, Scotland. No wonder the test load has been performed with twice the design load.
the 4th of March 1890 marks the official opening by the Prince of Wales, which later became King Edward VIII. Time to talk about the workers. How many men do you think were needed to build a bridge with the overall length of 2,067 meters, which includes the main structure of 1,630 meters? Work at the highest point of 110 meters above the high water and 137 meters above its foundations. Prepare, cut, assembly by using 6.5 million rivets and paint 53,000 tons of steel. Build complex steelwork connections. Here, one of the skew box at the base of the cantilevers. A complex intersection of steel members even for today's technology. Build two massive piers, aka pylons, using 110,000 cubic meters of concrete and masonry, and faced by two feet thick granite. Well, the answer is that, at the peak of its construction, there were 4,600 men involved in the fourth bridge construction. Unfortunately, with such challenges and harsh climatic conditions, there were lost 57 souls. But this is the historically official number. I need to share with you that research conducted by local historians points to 73 deaths, not 57. The main proof is that twin monument that 73 men who died in the process was unveiled by the former Scottish First Minister Alex Salmond in 2012, one on each side of the Fourth River. It is always tragic to lose people on sight. It touches us deeply. For their families, the design and management team, the site working force, and the surrounding communities. For me, these 73 men are heroes. I love bridges. They died building a structure that shows one of the best things of being human when we put ingenuity and desire to surpass the challenges, when we leave a good mark on this planet, such as a painting, a poem, a piece of music, a sculpture, a book, or a bridge. I thank you, fallen heroes. Don't think these numbers reflect a neglect of for the well-being of the workers by the designers and contractors. It is fair to highlight that they were safety boats, always on alert, and these saved at least eight men from drowning. The health and safety books recorded 26,000 entries for accidents and sickness. The estimate is that hundreds of workers were said to have been left crippled by serious accidents. The personal protection equipment, also known as PPE, supplied to the men that were working on the foundations, consisted of boots and waterproofs, while the ones working on the superstructure were given thick woolen jackets, overalls and waterproof shoes. Pictures are showing that everyone was using caps in that time, but we all know that no way it served as a protection against a falling steel object or a loose rivet. The workers had access to dining rooms and shelters. Here, a bucky, a Scots word, means shelters for workers. No wonder this bridge is visited by thousands every year, becoming one of the most visited Scottish built heritage sites, an absolute marvel of engineering. 26,000 trains crossed in the early years. Today, that number grew to 70,000 per year. No bad for an old steel lady. No harm was done to the bridge during the 1939 air attacks. The bridge itself hasn't been targeted. The 1935 Alfred Hitchcock classic film, The 39 Steps, based on the John Bochen book, had a great scene shot in the fourth bridge. It's against all the regulations to stop a train on the bridge. He's offered Hitchcock. He can stop a train on a bridge. 
Because when film wasn't enough, in 1959, Kenneth Moore made a new version. The lights were installed to celebrate the bridge centenary in 1990. Although the lights you are seeing on this picture were placed in 1999 as a push for the World Heritage listing. Well, it didn't work that time. The fourth bridge needed to wait a decade more. Not a big deal for the old lady. The fourth bridge is so important for the Scottish culture that it appears in a pound coin and at least three different banknotes. Here a fiver and a £20 note issued from two different banks in Scotland. And for the gamers, I guess the fourth bridge made an impact at GTA, Great Theft Auto and Pokemon Go games. I hope the Pokemon wasn't in the middle of the bridge, because you cannot stop a train on a bridge, unless you are Alfred Ditchcock. Nowadays, 200 trains use the bridge every day, carrying 3 million passengers each year. Do you like myths? Well, the one about the never-ending task of painting the Fort Bridge was Hunting Network Rail, and in 2001, Balfour Beatty won the bid to repaint the bridge. Old layers of paint were flaking and detaching from the steel, which was promoting corrosion. Action was needed. The problem is that one cannot simply go and paint over. The restoration process was very complex, blasting techniques a section at a time that left steel ready to receive the new coat of virtual impermeable paint. You are guessing that all this blasting and painting needed to have a proper safe environment. That is why a scaffolding system has been built surrounding the bridge structure. Some of it was suspended under the bridge. Mainly, the scaffold system was fixed to the existing structure by welding points. Inside those scaffolding cover segments, temperature and humidity were made optimal to apply the new coating system. Nothing new for Buffalo Beatty that used the North Sea oil industry techniques. This task took Balfour Beatty 10 years to complete. At some point, the outsiders like myself thought that another myth was being born. Wrong. These folks knew what they were doing. All these improvement works could disrupt the busy East Coast mainline rail link. The inspection results were astonishing. This century-old steelwork was mostly in great condition. Therefore, just minor repairs were made to the structure. Powerful industrial vacuum extractors removed tons of debris per hour. Well, and for the experts, the recipe for this kind of treatment is blasting it by making sure all dirt is collected. Create a perfect environment. Apply a coat of special anti-corrosion primer and let it dry. Apply by hand high-built epoxy glass-flaked paint to all the 6.5 million rivets and leading edges. Then, Repeat another coat to the entire structure. Keep doing it until the desired design thickness is achieved. Don't rush, just make it right. Finally, apply the top coat, that beautiful red. A red that has a special name, the Fort Bridge Red, color graded to match the original oxide coloration of the bridge. Now, you can rest, but just for 25 years, because by then, you need to start over again. I don't accept this as another myth, but the price that needs to be paid to keep the lady so beautiful and sound. The restoration job was completed in December 2011, and I was lucky enough to have been invited by Balfour Beatty to visit the site. Sorry for the quality of the recording and some of the images. As a curiosity, the total painted area of the Fort Bridge is 230,000 square meters, requiring 240,000 liters of paint. If I go to the high street and buy some paint, which is around 20 pounds per liter, 5 million pounds were needed to paint the bridge, just one coat. Today, the fourth bridge dances in harmony with its two younger sisters. She is not a shadow from the past. She is majestic and graciously shares the landscape with the other sisters. 
sometimes in focus, other times just happy to stay in the background. No one will ever change her history. Her past is beautiful and her future will be shared with all of us. Nowadays, nearly 40 kilometers of cables are connecting the over 1,000 lights installed on the Fort Bridge. One light for each designer. One light for each worker of the Fort Bridge and their families. One light for everyone that cannot pass by without being stunned by her beauty. A light for all bridge lovers. A light for every single one of you. What an amazing bridge indeed. I hope you enjoy it and you become more curious to know and find out more things about this bridge. It's time to say goodbye for today. But before that, please take a couple of seconds to answer today's question. And the today's question is, for your design and detailing of your bridges, are you using 3D or still using 2D CAD? Please take some time on the right hand corner of your screen and select your answer. That is much appreciated. Next week's episode will be, as promised, a very simple, no complex at all version what is Brim about. I appreciate if you leave a comment, like and subscribe your Ministry of Bridges. See you next week and have a Brimmer day. It's against all the regulations to stop the train on the bridge.